I mean, you just know it when you hear it. <sighs> Let's face it. It's been a long, cold winter year, past like 13 months. Whatever. It's been a rough time. And hopefully better days are ahead of us. I say this not to remind everybody of how awful our current situation is, but maybe to offer some hope in the form of pop punk. Now, pop punk, it won't save us from anything, but it can engender feelings of nostalgia, joy, and youthful optimism, and the feelings of fresh optimism that can sometimes happen on an annual basis. There's something about the rise of summer that goes hand in hand with pop punk. It's true in 2021, and it was true way back in 2001. Ah yes, back in the spring of 2001, when Sum 41 broke onto the popular music scene with All Killer, No Filler. Now some of the bands I talk about on this channel, they could be considered underrated. Sum 41 does not fit that bill. They were absolutely huge in this era, and they have the hardware to back it up. All Killer, No Filler has sold roughly 2.3 million units worldwide, charted at number 7 in the UK and number 13 in the US, and has a song that reached number 1 on the Billboard Rock Charts. And above all those rankings, Sum 41 became pop stars off of this album. And I would say that in a very small way, this album uniquely popularized a style of pop punk. But first, let's go back to the beginning. Sum 41 formed in the mid-90s in Ontario, Canada. After going through a few different lineups, they would settle on their classic era lineup around 1999. Roughly around that time, they would ink a deal with Island Records and in 2000 release Half Hour of Power. It was an amazing EP. I know All Killer No Filler is their official debut, but Half Hour of Power was a very strong outing to announce themselves on the scene. The band would go on to attach themselves with Canadian independent label Aquarius, and perhaps most importantly, they enlisted the help of the late great Jerry Finn on production, and the rest as they say, it was history. But the story didn't end with All Killer No Filler. In the years since, they've gone on to continued success with a nice catalog of content that didn't always follow the pop punk formula that they had so much success with in 2001. Over the years, the band has seen members come and go, and actually come back, but they've remained an active touring draw, with only a slight interruption back in 2014 when lead singer Derek Wibley was hospitalized and in very serious condition due to alcoholism. Thankfully, he seems to have come out of it okay. Like I mentioned earlier, they go into a lot of different stylistic directions. On the punk side, the band has talked about their admiration for a lot of the mid-90s bands that were really percolating at the time, and I think it kind of shows in their music. This might be sacrilege, but I could see a world where Sum 41 was a epitaph or fat band from the late 90s. Now Jerry Finn, he was a perfect choice for producer, but in an alternate universe, I'd love to see what Ryan Green could have done with them. And like a lot of the OG Fat Records bands, Sum 41 was clearly influenced by metal. Early on, it seems as if the metal love was kind of played out for camp, but as you examine the band further, you find that they have a pretty deep reverence for the metal side of the game. And of course, any respectable pop punk band can turn up the boy band charm whenever they want. Sum 41 doesn't sound like Green Day, but I think they share a lot of the same positive attributes. Most importantly, they both write great songs that would be good regardless of the genre. Secondly, they can actually play and thus they sound great. And finally, the dynamics of the lead singer hold those bands together. Both Wembley and Billy Joe Armstrong have a special charisma that constantly affects the style of a perennial snotty 13 year old boy. The vocal styling of both lacks the high-pitched nasal quality that so many who hit the genre claim is such a turnoff. So let's get back to Old Killer No Filler. Now you can't talk about this album without referencing its biggest hit, Fat Lip. I mean, you just know it when you hear it. The end. You suck! Any list of essential pop punk songs must include Fat Lip. I mean, there's just so many cliches in this one. Let's just take a listen to this chorus. It's completely cliche, but that's not a bad thing. The song, it's like a time capsule in so many different ways. Not only does it have a total vibe of an early 2000s pop punk song, but let's face it, incorporating hip hop elements was something that didn't seem so strange at the turn of the century. The 2020s were not the only time that those two genres could collide. And maybe it's the multiple vocalists, but Fat Lip really seems like it's three different songs stitched together, but it kind of works. It's a bit of a checklist of different pop punk themes. But like most major radio hits, 
Fat Lip isn't exactly representative of the rest of the album. In fact, it's not all nearly as silly as Fat Lip suggests. I'm not saying it's Morrissey, but it's also not 30 minutes of jokes. The album's nicely bookended with some Iron Maiden cosplay. And honestly, the first few songs are all slack in their own way. The pace changes with In Too Deep, which was a minor hit, but I think it's actually a bit of a weak point on this album. Goes great on the American Pie soundtrack, though. But it's after In Too Deep that the album really shows its strength with a string of solid songs. These songs are a mix of up-tempo pop-punk bangers with other songs that really benefit from slowing it down. Of this basket of songs, Crazy Amanda Bunkface stands tall well rest. That's the album. But earlier I mentioned that I felt this album helped popularize a certain genre of pop punk. Let me explain exactly what I mean. So I want to be clear. All Killer No Filler didn't start the immature, jokey pop punk aesthetic. But they might be the first band to ride that wave right out of the gate. As I've talked about in other videos, pop punk bands of the early 2000s were not the first groups to combine punk rock and adolescent humor. It's always been there. But I think Blink-182 was the first band to completely ride the aesthetic to pop stardom. So why bring up Sum 41 if I just said that Blink-182 is the one that popularized this aesthetic for the masses? And yeah, that's true. But it took them a minute to get there. It took six years and two full-length releases from Blink before they exploded in popularity. As far as the public, Blink-182 paid their dues. Don't throw your axes at me, please. But lest this sound like a hatchet job, anyone can make a bad throw. Now, I don't want to minimize the respective dues that Sum 41 definitely did pay, but unless you're completely embedded in the scene in the late 90s and the year 2000, the songs from Old Killer No Filler were likely the first time anyone caught wind of Sum 41. The landscape was ripe for Sum 41 to make an impact. In the spring of 2000, Blink-182 was just about to release their second smash in three years, and the offspring were pumping out platinum albums with comedic radio hits. But pop punk was still sharing real estate with another music phenomenon, new metal. New metal might have been the preferred rock choice for the frat boys, but outside of one band, its aesthetic and vibe was not very fun. At this point in 2001, new metal was still very popular, but its appeal was fading and transforming into its second wave. The success of Sum 41 was representative of the sea change that was happening in youth alternative but mainstream culture. After Old Killer No Filler, plenty of bands broke into the mainstream early on with this same basic formula. But Sum 41, they were the first. In retrospect, how do you feel about the legacy of Old Killer No Filler? Sound off in the comment section below and don't forget to like and subscribe. Talk to you next time.